Ephesians chapter 6, you come there with me. Uh, Lord willing, next Sunday we'll complete this book, and I've been grateful. I'm not in a hurry, obviously, I think you know that. I like to get all of it, you know. It's like when you're eating ice cream, I don't throw it out when there's some on the edge. I keep working that until you get it all out. And sometimes you realize you got part of the bottom or the wax or something. I got too far on that. But uh, I want to get everything in the Word of God, and, and uh, I just love to study God's Word, and, and I, I want Him to speak to me, and, and uh, want Him to speak to all of us tonight, praying that way. Last week, as we mentioned this morning, we looked at our adversary in verse 10 through 12 there, the devil and his demon hordes, our adversary. And today we began this morning to look at our armor that God has given. So let's pick up again, reading Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We do wrestle, but not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. We said this morning, he's in chains, chained to a Roman guard. Maybe he's looking at this armor as he pens this. He's looking at the armor of these soldiers and that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And I want to continue with this uh, title this morning. You see the emphasis of the Word of God there in verse 11, to stand against the wiles of the devil. In verse 13, uh, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all to stand, and then stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So the title, Stand. To stand, we need the whole armor of God. Look at this morning, stand firm, verse 13. Stand firm, stand fast. Stand therefore, he says. The power to stand at all comes from the Lord. And the power of his might, verse 10. In verse 13, notice that emphasis on the whole armor. The whole armor, he mentions that in verse 11. God has provided it for us. Stand in that armor. Number two, we look at stand true in verse 14. Having our loins girt about with truth. The power of his might, verse 10, comes from the power of his truth. Stand true like the belt that holds everything together. Or girt, live the truth, not a lie. Stand in the truth. Then we look at stand right. Uh, verse 14 again. That breastplate of righteousness. The power of his might comes from the power of a right heart. You know, we have something the world does not have. We can be clean. We can be thoroughly right with God. Well, there's something powerful to be able to go to bed right, right in your mind and right in your heart, right in your relationship with God, right in your relationship with others. Stand right, the right heart before God. The Bible says about many in the Bible that are heroes, that they had a heart perfect toward the Lord, a right heart, right spirit. Verse uh, number four, we looked at stand prepared. That's where we stop. Verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The power of his might from, comes from the power of the gospel. Stand prepared to give the gospel. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Praise the Lord. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so we're fighting from victory. Praise the Lord. We're not uh, in a doom and gloom situation. Jesus has already won the victory. And God says we're to stand and stand with him. Jesus is on the winning side and we're on his side. Stand, he says, stand therefore. That emphasis in verse 14. And may God help us. Number five, we see tonight, stand in faith. Verse 16. 
I think it's interesting. No word in the Bible is of, uh, of no consequence. Verse 16 begins with what phrase? Above all. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, God gives an order and he started with truth. And we, and we, uh, we talked about that. And, and without the truth, you know, you're open to everything else. But here he says, above all. That's interesting. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith he should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The power of his might comes from the power of faith in God. Stand in faith. And listen, the armor of the believer, of course, is a spiritual armor. We are in a spiritual battle. And so faith is key because everything the world is shooting at us, you think about it, it's always they get us to look by sight. And if you look at the Christian life and the Christian walk by sight, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. Well, how, how can someone just speak the world into existence? How can you just believe and then you're going to go to heaven? You don't have to work for it. You have to do it. Everything the devil's trying to do is always to chink at that faith that we would trust God without question. Now, even we, we had some visitors this morning. And I don't know their hearts. I'm not, not pretending to know. I'm not, not saying this about them. But I see this sometimes, especially in our day with visitors. They and I think you have to listen to a certain degree this way. But once you know the word of God is being preached and you shouldn't be listening this way, certainly you that know this church and are members of this church. But sometimes we're not careful in the world we live in. We, we listen with a mentality of almost, well, let me see, let me think. What do I think about that? I don't know. You know, and almost like we're trying to decide if we're going to believe it. Whereas the way we ought to listen to God's word is already in the spirit of yes to Jesus Christ. And whatever you say to me, my answer is yes. And I believe what God's word says. Now, certainly we, it ought to be verified by the scripture. Like the Bereans, they search the scriptures. I'm not, not talking about that. But sometimes, you know what I mean? Like, it's almost like you're listening to some lecture and people sometimes are like, hmm, I don't think about that. We ought to be saying, oh God, if you're speaking to me, it's yes, Lord, this is what I want to live and do. And so by faith, you say, well, I don't know if it doesn't make all sense. Well, that's kind of the point with faith, isn't it? Uh, God does give us proofs and evidences. I'm grateful for that, but we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And so this is so key that we're willing to stay in the spiritual realm, in the faith realm. And we don't say we have to have sight. Stand in faith. See, the armor is spiritual. We are to stand in that armor. And by the way, that armor is Christ. It's the living Christ. See, Satan himself in the book of Job, he actually described even how God protects his own. Now listen to Job chapter 1 verse 10. I'm reading Job right now. He says, hast not thou made an hedge about him? This is the devil talking to God. Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, that's our Lord. And praise the Lord. God has provided protection for us today. It is his armor. And he says, Take the whole armor of God. Use it. Take it. Put it on. Notice the last word of verse 16 there. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts. What's the last word? Wicked. Of the wicked. The wicked. Look, he throws many fiery darts. The devil, his demons. Look, he has been studying human nature for thousands of years. He, he, he is very experienced. Satan helped forge fallen human nature. He was there from the beginning. He's a master psychologist. You're not going to outsmart the devil. See, one person he attacks with the lust of the flesh. He has a whole arsenal of darts in that vein. From all different angles, trying to set the senses aflame. And then another person he attacks with the lust of the eye. Another with the pride of life, the lust of appetite, the love of applause, the lure of ambition. All these are among the host of darts in that vein. See, Satan uses to kindle fierce fires of temptation in our souls. And he knows our weaknesses, the, the, the human condition. He knows the strengths. He sends his legions of hell, these evil spirits to pique our senses, inflame our desires, corrupt our souls, weaken our wills, deceive our minds. Think about this. To deaden our consciences. 
Boy, there's so much of the video games and, and things we see that are trying to deaden our conscience and sear our conscience. Like I talked about this morning with lying. Uh, so often we become so used to lying or half-truths or, or, or implied things or leaving out withholding truth that, that it doesn't even hit our conscience. And then the devil is constantly working to distort God's truth. Satan has a thousand wiles, a thousand tricks, and he never gives up. Look, praise the Lord, you can have victory in this day. And every day, God wants us to have victory. He's won the victory. And as we stand with him, as we walk in his presence, as we get our face before him every day and say, Lord, I can't, but I believe you can. And I'm dying to myself and with your spirit. Let me walk in the spirit so I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We can have victory every day. But let me tell you, you can have victory today. He'll be back tomorrow. He does not give up. He'll be back again, again later. Perhaps he'll tempt you, tempt you with some book. Perhaps something on TV. Uh, perhaps some clever argument that some college professor or someone that's supposed to have so many degrees can bring up. Or, or he'll tempt you with a friend that snubs you and begins to start an anger in you. And perhaps he'll arouse a sleeping lust, an old sin, or put some lewd or corrupt thought in your mind. And perhaps he'll entice you with some brilliant, seemingly flawless philosophy. It would do you well for many of you to read C.S. Lewis. Most of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia, all, all the. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screw Tape Letters. And it's written from the other side, meaning how the demons and how the devil's strategy is trying to trip us up, and written from their side of the way they're trying to get us to deviate from the Word of God. Hey, they have a strategy and they've been working it for years. And, and this is something that we're not prepared for outside of God. We need the Lord. We need the armor of God. Listen, you'll never be out of the range of Satan's fiery darts. He's going to keep shooting them. But they can be quenched, meaning they can be made harmless. How? Above all, taking the shield of faith. Faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Listen, friend, Satan's fiery darts can't penetrate the shield of determined, living, dynamic faith in God and his word. Amen. It cannot penetrate. That's why Satan designed the first temptation as he brought to Eve in the Garden of Eden. That first temptation was to persuade our first parents that God cannot be trusted. He wanted to break down right away their faith, their faith. The very first temptation questioned the goodness of God. Can I trust God unequivocally? And can we really believe Romans 8, 28? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Can I really believe that? Can I really trust him? This doesn't look good. This doesn't feel good. I'm not happy about whatever happened in this situation. We live in a world with disease and death and all kinds of things, harm that comes. Can I trust God? First temptation, question the goodness of God, that God was unkind, that God was holding out on us. God was keeping back some good thing from us. Listen to Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord of God had made. And he said to the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, no, there's one tree he won't let us eat of. The second temptation questioned the government of God. Satan begins to implant the idea that disobedience to God is not really that big a deal. Oh, well, come on. No one lives perfect. It's not that serious. It's just a little sin. It's just a little white lie. It's just something small. It's no big deal. Everybody's doing it. Look at the day and age we live in. You can't live that pure and righteous. He begins to chink away at submitting to God's authority in your life. And that's exactly what he did. Genesis 3, 4. He's saying, look, it's not a serious matter. The consequences, the adverse result of that sin, it won't be what God said it would. I mean, it's not a big deal. Genesis 3, 4. And the serpent said to the woman, ye shall not surely die. See, there's a question mark at the end of verse 1. First, Satan questioned the word of God. 
And then he contradicts it, flat, de flat denies God's word. Ye won't die. Ye shall not surely die when God said you would. Then the third temptation, question the goals of God. What's God's goal for man? Again, what a terrible accusation toward God's character, towards God's integrity, to suggest that God was holding out on man and God was somehow selfishly and deliberately harming man to, uh, from attaining true enlightenment. Don't you know when you have this fruit, you'll, know, you'll be like gods. You'll know good and evil. Well, tell me, they knew God. So what did they already know? They knew all the good. So what did they gain? Just evil. <laughs> the Bible tells us we're to be simple to that which is evil. Wise to that which is good. But hey, you don't need to uh, delve into the occult. You don't need to delve into false uh, cults like the Mormon church and, and Catholicism and, and, and Hinduism. Or, you, know, you don't need to delve into that. Be simple to that. What we need to study is the word of God. May God help us. Oh, God's holding out on you, see. Listen to Genesis 3, 5. For God doth know. Hey, God knows something. And he's holding out. God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. For those of us that lived a little while, let me just say, children, teenagers, there's some things I wish my eyes weren't open to. Hey, having your eyes opened is, is, all, all, is not always what it's cut out to be, what you think it is. There is a certain disillusionment, unfortunately, in life when you realize no one's as good as you think they are. Meaning we all are sinful, flawed men. And there's certain things you begin to find out about even good people. Uh, you read second... Uh, yeah, I think it is 2 Samuel. Uh, anyway, where, where David falls. You read that for the first time, I think 2 Samuel 12. You're thinking, David? No, not David. David, the man after God's own heart. Not David to murder, to, to commit adultery. There's some things you begin to find out that you don't want to know. <laughs> Be simple to it. Stay away from it. You see, in this struggle in the Garden of Eden, Eve threw away the only weapon that she had, the Word of God. She didn't understand fully what it meant that you'll surely die. She didn't know what this tree would really do. The only thing she had to stand on was this is what God said, and so it's right and it's good. I'm going to trust Him by faith. But the second she got off that standing, the only thing that was concrete that could give her confidence and boldness in the face of temptation, once she stepped off that, she had no solid ground to stand on. And the result was she was deceived and she lost her faith in God and was pierced by Satan's fiery darts. Now here's the amazing part. Again, God teaches us not to be ignorant of the devil's devices. Satan presented the exact same three temptations to Jesus Christ. Now you think about that. Oh, not the exact same scenario, but the exact same veins. He moved from one to the next. Let me just point them out to you. Matthew 4, 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. Look, here Satan is tempting and suggesting that God the Father is withholding an entitlement from Jesus. So here we go again. Satan's challenging the goodness of God. I cannot believe that your God has had you not been able to eat anything for 40 days. God's holding out. God's withholding. The second temptation, of course, challenge the government of God. Hey, go ahead. Cast yourself down. Jump off the pinnacle of the temple. Cast yourself down. You won't die. God won't let that happen. Hey, to put God to the test and presume upon him, it's no serious matter. It's okay. Matthew 4, 6, Say unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it's written, he shall give thy angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Well, he didn't dash his foot against a stone. He's telling them to jump off. And then the third temptation, challenge the goals. Of God, Satan's slanderously implying here 
that God was jealous and selfishly withholding these kingdoms of the world and keeping Jesus from the, the kingdoms that were rightfully his. Matthew 4, 8, again, the devil take them up to an exceeding high mountain, show them all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. Verse 9 says, and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if I will fall down and worship me. Praise the Lord, just like Ephesians 6 said, the Lord Jesus uses the sword of the spirit, uses the word of God. Trusting the faith, by faith, God's word is right and real every day. Every fiery dart with that shield of faith, he quenches. Satan could not get access. Jesus just kept falling back on the word of God. Falling back on the word of God. And by so doing, he demonstrated his confidence, his unending faith in the word of God. It is enough. God is able, John Phillips said, our faith in God should be so alive, so robust that we never question the circumstances in which we find ourselves. The limitations he's placed on us or his right to dictate the terms of our lives. The place, the process, and the time period are all in his purposes. Such faith effectively quenches Satan's darts. Stand, he says. Stand, therefore. I think about Job, like I said, I'm reading. It doesn't make sense what happened to Job. Job does not know the conversation that's going on with the devil in heaven. He doesn't know that. And his wife comes to him and says, after these two waves, and here he's scraping the boils now, and God allowed him to touch his body, but not kill him. He's already lost his kids and stuff on that day. Now another wave hits, and finally she comes and says, just curse God and die. And he says to her, he says to her, now you got to understand, we don't get hard on Job's wife. She lost 10 children. Put yourself in that shoes. She lost 10 of her children. She lost everything too. She's seen her husband go through his torments. He says, you're, he didn't say you're speaking, he didn't say you are a foolish woman. He says you're speaking as one of them. He says, should we receive good at the hand of the Lord and not evil? Wow. What, it was he, what he was saying is we can trust God. Later on in the book, he said, yea, he slay me. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But God's heart is good. God's character is good. Whatever God is doing in my life, I don't understand why, but it's good. I'm going to trust by faith that it is. That, that's, that's the only thing we have because we don't see all that and we don't know all that. and We're in a spiritual battle, but I know my God and I know he's good. By faith, I'm going to stand there. Stand, therefore. Number six, uh, stand protected. Stand protected. Look at verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The helmet of salvation. The power of his might comes from the power of a saved mind. A saved mind. Stand protected. Look, lots could be said here, but I want you to know the devil is after the mind. The battle is in the mind. That's where the battle is. The mind. God gives us a helmet to protect our thoughts from satanic influences and interference. Uh, the helmet refers to a mind now controlled by God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, In whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The devil is blocking the lost people's minds. He's, he's, he's blinding them lest God's word get in. Listen, Satan's lies are diabolically clever. He has good ones. He, he doesn't expect to fool you with some nothing. He's got good lies. And Satan's deceptions appeal to the unregenerate mind. They seem to make a lot of sense and they appeal to human pride. For instance, a creed in, in, in a religion that demands works seems more logical than the cross. Humanism is more attractive than holiness to the pride of man. Psychology seems more reasonable than salvation. Listen, Satan never gives up on his attacks on our thought processes. Well, we have to guard that we don't become people that think like the world and have a worldview that is of this world and not a biblical worldview. See, intellectual people, quote unquote, intellectual people today, what they think of people that would walk by faith in God is that we are leaping into the dark. Faith is a leap into the dark. But I want to tell you, faith is not a leap into the dark. Faith is a leap into the light. 
Jesus Christ is the light and we're going after him. We're following the light. We're not leaping in the dark. God has proved himself over and over and over again. We could go the rest of the hour, no problem, giving testimony of how God has worked and God has worked in your life and mine. God has a solid foundation for you and it's called the Word of God. And the Christian who studies the Bible and learns the meaning of Bible doctrines is not going to be led astray easily. I read a story this week about a man who was a preacher visiting this man. He used to be a deacon in a, in, a, in a local church right there, and he was now in a false cult. They sat at the table with open Bible. The preacher tried to reason with him from the truth of God's word and show him the truth, and it seemed like his mind was blinded by lies. So the preacher asked, how did you happen to turn away from a Bible preaching church and get involved in this belief, this cult? Well, the reply stunned the pastor. This is what the man said. It's a true story. Preacher, I blamed the church. I didn't know anything about the Bible and they didn't teach me much more. I wanted to study the Bible, but nobody told me how. Then they made me a deacon and I wasn't ready for it. It was too much for me. I heard this man preaching the Bible over the radio. It sounded as if he knew something. I started reading his magazine and studying his books, and now I'm convinced he's right. End of quote. What a tragedy. When he came to that local church, a local church began to work in his life, they didn't fit him with the helmet of salvation. Guard his mind. Too bad that church, if only they had practiced 2 Timothy 2.2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. This man might not have, not have been a casualty in battle. Friends, that's what discipleship is all about. Discipling others. We need mentoring discipleship. There's false cults and false doctrines and, uh, on the radio and TV and they use the name Jesus and they talk about the Bible. But it is not the Jesus of the Bible. And it's not the truth. Hey, Satan would like nothing more than to undermine our belief in the Bible as the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. If he can get you off that standing in faith and begin putting these minds through past that helmet of salvation. Listen, he's got you on the path he wants. Doubt. Hell, he loves doubt. Just a little bit of doubt. Just a little bit. Hath God said? That's where he starts. See, Satan would love to get us so occupied with the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, we lose sight of the world to come. Satan would love for us to lower our standards and allow the world to pour us into its mold. Or go the other extreme and make isolation the goal and mistake isolation for separation. See, Satan has 10,000 wiles. He doesn't care which ditch you get in. He just wants you in the ditch. He doesn't care where you go wrong. He just wants you off track of following the Lord, distracted, discouraged somewhere. He's got 10,000 wiles and all of them are aimed at controlling what we think. What we think. What we think. The battles of mind. See, God's protection for us is the helmet of salvation. Praise God, because of our salvation, think of this, one thing that helps our thinking every day is knowing Jesus could come back today. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. He could come back today. I'm gonna just trust on. I'm just gonna believe on. I'm just gonna faith on. He could come back at any moment. Jesus could come as we sang about tonight. We should use God's word in our walk with the Lord to test all our thoughts. For instance, would watching this movie would reading this book, would this help me? Would this be consistent with living a holy life? Would this be consistent with becoming like the Lord Jesus? Would the philosophies, would the ideas presented, would that meet the approval of God? Testing everything we allow our mind to think on. We allow uh, music or movies, videos, books, and so on. Listen, the more we wear the helmet of salvation, the more we'll think about the things of God. Fill our minds and memories with God's word and oh, dwell on the enormous cost of our salvation. What Jesus paid for you. It's ramifications in our life. <laughs> the love of God constrains me. 
thus judge for all. If one died for all, we're all dead. It should have been us. We should all be dead. Hey, henceforth, we ought to live for him who died for us. Stand, stand therefore. Number seven, stand successfully. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The power of his might, verse 10, comes from the power of the word of God. Stand successfully. You think about this, uh, the one time that word is even used in our Bibles is Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make the way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. Remember, we heard Thursday night, Peter tried to use a physical sword to defend Jesus in the garden. But he learned at Pentecost, didn't he, that the sword of the Spirit does a much better job. <laughs> As we heard Thursday night, Paul was physically prepared. Uh, excuse me, not Paul. Uh, Peter was physically prepared for a spiritual battle. He tried to use a physical sword in a spiritual battle. Moses tried the same thing, by the way. You read Exodus. And Moses killed that Egyptian. But 40 years later, he found out, like we sing that song sufficient, the word of God was enough. Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. He didn't, he didn't lift a sword, didn't have to. God took care of it. You see, a physical sword pierces the body. But a spiritual sword pierces the heart. The more you use a physical sword, the duller it gets. But the more you use the word of God, the sharper it gets. In your life and lives of others. Uh, a physical sword, it wounds to hurt, it wounds to kill, but a spiritual sword, the sword of the spirit, wounds to heal, to give life, doesn't it? Christ used the sword of the spirit to defeat Satan. Listen, the better you know the word of God, the easier it will be for you to detect Satan's lies, detect his deceptions, reject his offers. Hey, read the Bible through this year. <laughs> Every one of us ought to sign up and say, yes, I want to read it through this year. Lord, help us, all of us. Napoleon once said, the best form of defense is attack. The best form of defense is attack. Hey, Satan himself can't withstand the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The powers of earth and the powers of hell have no defense against the word of God. Listen, the best answer to secular humanism is the word of God. The best answer to evolution is the word of God. The best answer to materialism is the word of God. The best answer to behavioral psychology, liberal theology, cults, false religions is the word of God. It's the sword of the spirit. Look, the spirit, the devil is no match for the Holy Spirit. He's God. God's word is the breath of God, the Bible says. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Breath of God. Listen, it's alive with God's authority. Even when we pray, we should wield the sword of the spirit because it will cut those hindering hordes of Satan that's trying to stop you from praying. You ever get down to pray and you can't pray and this thought comes and then you hear something in the wind and oh yeah, the guy's coming by to, uh, to, to check the termites and all of a sudden you realize when this thought leads to this thought and I gotta fix that window, and all of a sudden, what am I doing? I'm supposed to be praying. What is that? Hey, we need to even use the word of God, the sword of the spirit in our prayers to get rid of the devil and the demons. They don't like that. The sword of the spirit. Hey, when we preach, no doubt about it, we should quote it. Because our power does not lie in words of man, man's wisdom. No, our power is in the word of God, the words that the Holy Spirit supplies. We should use the sword of the spirit when we face our problems, or when we face our uh, circumstances, our needs, our temptations. Use God's word. The word of God is what spoke the world into being. The word of God. Look, the word of God rang from the lips of Jesus in his magnificent authority when he cast out evil spirits. When he raised the dead, when he cleansed the lepers, was the word of God. Word of God. Look, the word of God is God breathed. It's the same breath that made man a living soul. He breathed into us the breath of life that quickened our spirit. Hey, are you downhearted? James 
or excuse me, Jeremiah 15, 16, thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. You perplexed about a decision? Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Are you tempted? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. You in trying circumstances, Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. Hey, we might not have all we need, but we have God's word. It is enough. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. God will meet the need. Christ is the living word. The sword of the spirit is powerful. Hebrews 4, 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In the final battle with the devil, the Lord Jesus, a sword will go out of his mouth, the Bible says. Now, Revelation 1.16, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as sunshine and his strength. Revelation 19.21 then says, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. What's that sword out of his mouth? Well, if you back up in Revelation 19, Revelation 19, beginning verse 11, I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he did judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. <laughs> the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, we'll be there on those white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And then in verse 21, it says, The remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. What's that sword? It's the word of God. That's what that sword is. The word of God. Listen, we need that sharp sword going out of mouths of Christians today. People need the truth. They need the word of God. The word of God's a powerful weapon. You and I are to use it. Stand, he says. Stand, therefore. As we conclude tonight, you start looking closely at this armor here, and we'll get into verse 18 and on next week on prayer, but... You start looking at closely at this list of armor, you begin to realize very soon that it's all talking about Jesus. <laughs> it's all talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ is the truth. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Now, Jesus Christ is our peace. The gospel is his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus Christ, it's his faithfulness that makes possible our faith. Listen, the reason we trust him, the reason we can faith him like we do is because he's been so faithful. He's never failed. Everything he's ever said has come true just like he said down to the smallest detail. And so because of his faithfulness, our faith is warranted for the days ahead. And Paul told uh, the Romans what to do with his armor. He said, put it on. <laughs> Look, he is our salvation. Jesus Christ is the word of God. I want you to go over to Romans 13 with me. Now, Paul said, what to do with his armor? Put it on. Wake up. Cast off sin. Put on Christ. Romans 13. Die to self. Allow Jesus to call the shots in your life. Romans 13, look at verse 11. And that, knowing the time. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer. Salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chamber and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. 
See, Satan wants to distract. Satan wants to divide. Satan wants to destroy. He's the real enemy that wants to stay in the shadows, wants to lurk hidden behind people, and they're my enemy, and that person, and that, that group of people. No, Satan is the thief that's come to steal and kill and destroy. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to kill your faith. He wants to destroy your family. Satan has come in full gear ready for battle. I just want to ask you, how about you? Put ye on the whole armor of God, he says. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ here in Romans. Put on the armor of light. It's insanity. Christians are living with an absolute insanity today. That we are walking out in this world like we're living in a picnic, some church picnic when we're, we're, the world is on fire and the devil is shooting. And I mean, you don't have to look far. Every one of us in this room could talk about people we knew that were in church and families and what the devil has done in their homes and their family. You don't have to look far. The word of God is full of examples. We, we've got to wake up. That's what he's saying in Romans 13. You see the difference between Paul's day and our day? Is people who are wandering, lifeless spiritually, who once knew something of God, once were hot on fire for God, they're still in the church calling themselves righteous. In fact, turn over to Revelation 3 and we're going to be through. Revelation chapter 3, look at it there. Revelation chapter 3 this is the church at Laodicea. See, Satan has deceived the members in the church. Look at Raymond, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. The Bible says, and I, I know thy works. Well, who's talking? Verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea is right. These things saith, amen. That's, that's one of the names of God. The faithful and true witness and beginning, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works and thou art neither cold or hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Why? Because thou sayest, I am rich. Increased with goods. Uh, by the way, this was their perception. This was perceived reality. Have need of nothing. And the Savior gave them the true reality. The Savior's perception, knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee. Buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Oh, may God help us to see. We put on the armor if we could see. Like I said this morning, uh, if I went out and take the trash out of one time, I saw a lion out in my backyard. Every time I'd come out with a weapon, I'd be prepared. Just one time seeing a lion in the backyard, I would say, there's a lion to lose. I'm not taking a risk. God opened my eyes and we see. Like Elisha prayed for his servant. Hey, there's more to be with us than be with them. What are we going to do, Elisha? There's more to be with us than be with them. God, and Elisha prayed. Lord, open his eyes, he might see. And he saw all these fiery chariots from heaven. Lord, help me to see. Lord, I need to see right he says, you can get eyes to have it. God will open your eyes. You may see, verse 19, and many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Oh, what a Savior. He's still knocking. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. And he with me. Satan has deceived the church members. Not recognizing how desperate their need is of God. No desire for God's word. No, no desire for prayer. No, no, not interested. Another church service? I don't know about that. No hunger. Not recognizing Satan is eating up their joy and eating up their family and involved in destroying their marriage and children. Hey, we've got to wake up, he says. Wake up from this insanity. Oh, hallelujah, though. The Lord says he's still offering ISAF. He will still open your eyes. Oh, I hope you pray every day as you read God's word. Lord, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things of thy law. And can I say the only wondrous thing is Jesus. Lord, help me see a, a new side of you today. Help me, help me turn that facet of that diamond to see another glory of my great Savior. 
Open my eyes that I might see. Praise God. He's still knocking. He's, he's still desiring to come in and breathe life into your home, into your heart, into our church. And send his power again. Be strong in the Lord. And the power of his might. Oh, we need to be praying. We need to be crying out to God. Oh, Lord, I want you to be real again to me. Give me a desire. Give me a desire to know your presence again. Romans 13, 11, and 12, and I'll end. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation near than when we believe. The night's far spent, the day's at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. It's time for battle. It's time to be strong in the Lord. Stand. Stand therefore. Let's pray.